Hi, my name is Annette Markham, and I'm a professor of media and communication and part of the Digital Ethnography Research Center at RMIT University in Melbourne, Australia. Today, I'm going to talk about ethics and online social research. But before I do that, I would like to express a great thank you to Envivo, who put together this conference and asked me to talk about um, digital ethics. It's a really important topic to me, and for the last week or so, I've been sort of paralyzed by the thought of doing a keynote about this topic because I think it's so important. We live in troubling times, not just because, but partly because we are in the midst of a pandemic. And the world seems to be crumbling around us. And for me, as a researcher, the issue about my own research methods and practice is not so much about doing research in a remote way, even though that's a condition that I have to face since I'm in isolation in Melbourne, as we all are in lockdown. But I think about why I'm doing research at all and what I want to be contributing to the betterment of society. It really strikes me now as a, a matter of concern, and I think that I can't speak about ethics and online social research without also speaking about the importance of stepping back from our research, regardless of what level we are at and what pressures we are under, to think about why we're doing research in the first place, and to find good fit between what we're doing and what we want the world to be, and then finding methods that will help us bring those things together. There's a lot to talk about in relation to ethics these days. Since 2016, it has been a topic of the news almost daily. And when it comes to digital technologies, there's a lot to talk about. I mean, we could be talking about how our personal data gets collected for good reasons, but then accidentally gets released into the public. Um, we could think about how platforms regularly collect data without our knowing. We could think about how platforms like Facebook, in the case of Facebook in 2014 specifically, I'm thinking, uh, regularly manipulates what we see on a, an app or a platform to test their interface, to test out new ideas, to see what works best. They call this A-B testing. And they do it generally without getting consent of users. Yet academics, if they want to do such kinds of interventions, definitely have to get consent from users. I mean, we could be thinking about how our data is collected and aggregated by huge companies that then um, resell it in, in already partially analyzed form back to different agencies around the world. In any case, ethics and ethical dilemmas surround us all the time. and. It seems that every day brings a new ethical conundrum. Today, I want to talk about um, some of the foundations of ethics in social research um, as those impact our methods and our practices. And I'm going to do that by swinging a little bit through history and how we have come to have the kinds of ethics regulations and ethical parameters that we actually have around doing social research. I want to talk about some of the conceptual shifts in discussions around ethics since the advent of the internet in the mid-90s. And then I also want to talk about some key elements of an impact model for ethics. So as I go through that, I'm hoping that we'll also talk about some of the challenges and um, parameters for doing digital research, just generally speaking. I would like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations 
they're the traditional owners of the land that I'm sitting upon. And I, like the rest of the RMIT community, respectfully recognize that we conduct our business on unceded lands. Long before they were colonized, the Wurundjeri people generated knowledge and studied ethics in their own ways in close connection with their lands. And I respect this knowledge and I hope that these sensibilities, both past and present, continue to influence how I think about ethics and qualitative research practice. In this slide, I summarize some of the things that have challenged me over the last 25 years of doing research in digital, online, remote, or what we call computer-mediated contexts. I'm actually not going to talk about these eight items in today's talk, but rather I want to draw your attention to them as being classic issues that have been studied over the last um, 25 years. Not only have we confronted these challenges, but many authors have written about such things. I thought I would show you as a little show and tell some of these books that sit on my shelves. Um, this book in 2003 by Mark Johns, Serena Chen, and John Hall is um, a fantastic book um, that really focused on techniques and challenges for what happens when we shift from face-to-face -to, -face to online environments for conducting social research, just like many of you are facing now. If you haven't done digital research before, these old texts are not actually out of date. They're really relevant. Likewise, this one is another one of my favorites by Chris Mann and Fiona Stewart, Internet Communication and Qualitative Research. This, again, like the previous, is a collection of thoughts about what it means to transform our research from face-to-face um, -to, -face to digital. If you want to know more about interviewing, this is one of the best books on online interviewing. It's by Nalita James and Hugh Busher. Janet Sammons writes a lot of books in this arena uh, around doing research online, and she also covers in detail a lot of ethics. And then I'd be remiss if I didn't mention um, one of my own texts edited with uh, my good colleague and friend Nancy Baim, where several experts in the field, including Christine Hine, who wrote this book, um, and some other key people in the area uh, talk about lots of the challenges of um, methods uh, in, in their online research. What I'm focusing on instead are some of the key ideas behind an impact model of ethics and um, a little bit of the, the history of how I got to this model for thinking about ethical practice um, and, and combining ethics um, very tightly with method. While we might think about ethics as something that um, informs what we will do in the future, sort of as a moral code or um, a set of ideas, I think that ethics are actually what we create as we do research. And I also think that ethics emerge and ethical dilemmas emerge over and over and over again as we go through uh, any kind of a research project. We're challenged in many ways um, and we make many decisions that have an impact whether or not we know what that impact is. And given that all research and all of our um, choices on the everyday level of doing research will have impact at some level. I suggest through this impact model that we should embrace that role and proactively engage in research that is meant to have impact of a certain kind so that we can not simply avoid doing things that might cause harm, which is a very paramount 
feature of uh, most ethical regulations, but that we can also start doing things that create better possible futures. So an impact model of ethics is uh, an, a bit of an attitude, a mindset, more than a guideline or a set of rules. And so as I discuss it here, I think it's important to recognize that it's not a replacement for extant guidelines and regulations, but a, a key addition to thinking about what we want to do with our research, not just what we want to do as we research. So let me get into a little bit of how I got to this point. So I'm going to back up to the mid 20th century, where um, I'll just mention that most ethical regulations that impact you and your decisions about what to study and how to study people were born. Following World War II um, and the Nazi war crimes, um, many agencies and nations got together to create um, formalized regulations around research with the assumption that certain moral principles could be universalized and that they were recognizable, such as do no harm. So they're developed in the mid 20th century and persists today an attitude of error avoidance. And that's not a bad thing. Um, I'm just gonna suggest later that error avoidance models um, are not sufficient because they only tell us what we can't do. They're not very good at suggesting what we might do or should do. Some of the classical principles of ethical research are you know, things like respect for persons, justice, and beneficence. And you can read more about these later. I don't talk about them here. They're codified in the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, the Belmont Report, the Helsinki Declaration, the Nuremberg Code, and other places. But when we think about these principles, what I find important is that they get operationalized in very particular and narrow ways over time. Human subjects, informed consent, privacy protection, vulnerability, and um, these are determined as an outcome of thinking about the risks versus the benefits of doing research that might be risky or might cause harm. So when we get to the internet, what, what researchers and philosophers started to realize is that the principles as they had been operationalized were ill-suited for the kinds of research that qualitative researchers do and ill-suited for digital research contexts. Specifically, it can be difficult to determine what exactly is a human subject when you're looking at a blog, for example. So is a blog a text that was authored by a human and therefore you should cite the human and give an attribution to their, their work as if they are authors? Or is the blog an extension of the human? Is it an extension of my body when I tweet? Is it an extension of myself when I post images? And therefore, should my images, posts, or tweets be protected in the same way that humans are protected? This is a really good question, and it persists today. Um, another question is, how do we get and should we get informed consent? Um, this is not just a problem of digital research, but, um, but, but particularly in, in online contexts, it can be complicated to figure out who's in the actual situation that we would need to get consent from. So in Facebook groups, when people enter and exit in ways that we can't always um, control, how can we know that they have been informed, much less consent to our research of them? It's a great question. Again, not a single answer. 
but a good question. And there are many subcomponents to that question, and I'm not even getting into the difficult um, complexities of what informed consent has become. Likewise, with um, issues of privacy, we encounter many of the same complications. First, it's almost impossible to protect privacy. And many um, recent cases since 20, I don't know, around 2015, have demonstrated that even in the most seemingly secure, anonymized and scraped and cleaned data sets, it is possible to piece back together information or to aggregate information from various sources in order to link um, anonymized data to people who produced it. Um, so it's quite interesting. And you can read about this um, in an easy way by looking at the, uh, the case of OkCupid okay in 2013, the dating app. The other issue around privacy is that um, there's a big difference between actual privacy and perceived privacy. And this has become a, a topic for people to think about theoretically as well as empirically. So we can't actually assume that everyone has the same definition of what privacy is. And it's difficult to um, assess what it actually is that needs to be protected in order to give someone a sense of privacy. A good case of this is when um, Alice Marwick and Dana Boyd, two um, digital culture researchers, were looking at high school students' use of digital media and ran into a case where um, some students at a high school felt very outraged that their public profiles on Facebook had been shown to the entire school as part of a presentation by the local police on why you shouldn't have a public profile on Facebook. They knew that the data was public. Youth aren't always digital natives, but they're also not stupid. And so they knew that their their profiles were public and they didn't they didn't care about that part of it. What they cared about was that the information had been used in a context that was unexpected. So when the information crossed to a different context, then they felt outraged and violated. So it's very difficult to ascertain what privacy means to people and when it might become an issue. The other um, very tricky issue is about vulnerability. Um, in traditional ethics regulations, vulnerability was a category designated for people like um, incarcerated prisoners or pregnant women or children. Those are just some of many categories of people who are considered vulnerable. And these were developed as categories when the focus of ethical regulation was on biomedical research, so it's to protect people from um, undergoing drug testing when, you know, maybe they shouldn't get a shot of some unknown drug in the arm, or they can't control uh, whether or not they participate in a study, um, or maybe they don't know enough about themselves or uh, life in general to be a participant. Those are all useful operationalizations of the concept of vulnerability, but what we have found is that vulnerability often occurs after the fact. So this has, so this has become uh, another of those issues that is uh, highly contested, uh, not only because of the internet, but certainly in this era. And finally, a risk-benefit ratio is not at all an, a universal perspective. So what we've come to understand is that our enactment of ethics is actually based in large part on how we conceptualize ethics in the first place. And ethics is a terrible word. It's vague. It's not framed in very user-friendly ways. It, when it is discussed in a philosophical way, it becomes very abstract. When it is discussed in a regulatory way, it becomes very narrow. 
And so um, it's not a very uh, easy or useful, in my opinion, term. I prefer the idea of doing the right thing or avoid being creepy as a way to think about ethics, especially because most of our enactment of ethics is going to be not at these big levels of thinking about human subjects. It's going to be about micro decisions that we make that we don't even think about during the process of doing research. And I'm going to talk about some of those later. Uh, so one of the things that occurred along this path of history is that we started to really rethink some of those concepts, as I just mentioned. So you can see this as a, a concept-driven approach that, that is swiftly aligned with a process-oriented approach. One way we can think about this, and I've been trying to draw visuals of this for many years, um, although you, you, um, you wouldn't think it on the basis of the visual I'm just going to show you now. Um, One way to think about this is to go back to the basic core ideas about what methods are in the first place. And I suggest here that um, methods are simply choices that we make at certain decision points where we encounter something where we, you know, like we have to make a decision. Oh, should I collect this or that data? Um, can I sample in this way or that way? Um, should I? Uh, interview at this time zone or that time zone. And every time we hit one of these sort of mundane decisions uh, at various stages in the research project, we create a path and we go down one route while eliminating or obscuring all of the other possible paths that could have been taken. So in this way, um, with this wonderful illustration of mine, and I mean that in the ironic way I just said, um, it's, it's clear that there, there's a lot of agency in us as decision makers in the construction of um, not only the research field, but of the data that gets um, collected or discarded as irrelevant along the way. Another way to think about this, and again, you can see me playing with the models, is to consider all of the decision points you might encounter in your own research project. And this is just me thinking about all of the decision points in my own kind of empirical social science study way. This can get a bit dizzying to think about the fact that each of these decisions takes us down a different path. And each decision has a consequence. I mean, obviously. But then when you think about the ethics behind it, you can sort of start to complicate the, the matter of ethics and say to yourself, Wow, ethics doesn't just happen before I start the study. Ethics occurs again and again and again. And each of these different decision points or, or moments of a study has a different ethic at play. So ethics is much more complicated than we think it is once we start to take a process-oriented approach toward ethics. I then started to think about um, ethics and, and uh, greater degrees or lesser degrees of impact. And I was, I was building yet more models to think about um, scales or decision points. But in this case, this particular graphic helps me think about the fact that um, even when I say my research has impact, there are going to be different layers and levels of impact. Some of those are going to be short-term, immediate, and obvious. 
Others might be very eventual, long-term, not obvious. So there are different scales at which we can think about um, ethics. Not only should we be asking good questions about how to avoid harm, but we should be thinking about what we might be doing to influence the kinds of impact we might have. So in general, you see a shift, and I think now we're at a stage, and this is where the impact model sits, where we as researchers in the academy are starting to really, really embrace both our responsibility and the opportunity to make social change and to engage more with the activities that are happening outside of the walls of the academy. Or they're being more blatantly critical and activist in their research discussions and taking a role of advocacy and critique. Again, the idea behind this impact model of ethics is that we play a role in creating the future. That we're not just studying, observing, and neutrally conveying a sense of culture to others. We might be doing that. But also, at another level, we are um, generating knowledge that has a direct impact on how our students think, on how platforms respond to our critique in the public sphere, how governments change policies based on our research findings. So there is this idea and the mindset that um, ethics involves much more than guidelines or rules. It's, it's meant to have us pay attention to how we want to behave and what then what tools we use in order to um, achieve the goals that we have. In some ways, it asks us to return to some of the core foundations of the research process. And that is thinking really closely about what are our motivations for doing research in the first place. So let me go through very briefly an impact framework for thinking about ethics in the context of digital research. I lay this out in four different impact arenas because the issues involved in doing digital research involve much more than just treatment of people. So I'm not going to review closely the first arena except to say that once we start to broaden what we think of as people, we can start to have a better understanding of how our tools might have an impact that we're unaware of. So while typical ethics regulations focus on the subjects of research, this impact arena where we talk about treatment of people can refer to a broad swath of people who are affiliated with or associated with the study but might not be the actual subjects. For example, the self. The Treatment of people can also extend to thinking about the chains of people who are impacted by research on a specific phenomenon. So while we might not have a person sitting on the other side of the table as we do an interview, we might be studying phenomena that is accidentally having an impact on communities of practice or categorizing people in particular ways or manipulating their environment in ways that are unhelpful. The second area of impact relates to side effects. And while these are natural and inevitable in any research, it's relevant to the situation of digital research because of the many ways that data is separated from people. A case in point would be the Havasupai nation in the United States who donated blood data at one point and many years later that blood data was used again um, for a different purpose. And the, the later research analyzed the data and made the claim that the Havasupai were not actually from their native lands and that they were prone to um, 
schizophrenia. The outcome of the of learning that their data had been used in such a way was devastating for the tribe. And it is an obvious unintended side effect of the original research. Um, and it is in some ways unavoidable, um, or it, it, it can be seen to be unavoidable. But one of the things that this impact model of ethics is trying to do is to get people to think ahead and to try to anticipate the ways in which the data might be reused in ways that it shouldn't be reused, or the ways in which people might want to tag or note or um, save or protect the data so that it is not used in unintended ways in the future that have harmful impact to the communities it was drawn from. So um, to, to avoid some of these side effects is to think about ethics in an iterative fashion. So for example, one might continuously ask for consent which is a, now a quite common practice. And even if people gave consent, um, they, can, they can and often do change their mind later on. So it's something to really be aware of that, that there are many side effects to what we do, and often those are going to be unseen and maybe unavoidable. But um, the more we think about it, the more we're likely to be able to catch those things. The third area of impact seems closely related to the second. And here I focus on um, use of data. And here I don't mean the use of data that might have side effects, but the use of data that creates categories of people or uh, classifies or organizes findings in ways that can have uh, consequence on larger social meanings. This arena draws on critical theory and cultural studies disciplines where uh, power imbalances are always of concern. And so as with the, the idea that there are unintended side effects of what we do, um, we also have to think about how our characterization of people and our invention of new knowledge through our findings has the ability to marginalize people, but also it could have the flip side. It can help to um, amplify certain voices. So it, it's a, a matter of thinking not just about avoidance of harm or mitigating um, how we create categories, but that we can have a positive impact by thinking about what we what what we want to constructively contribute to changing the world the fourth area of impact is more a long scale thinking or a large scale about what kinds of impacts our research has on how we think in the future and what social structures look like this is a uh, often something we don't think we necessarily have control over um, these long downstream effects of what we do. Uh, and perhaps we only make a little bit of a difference in the world. But on the other hand, if you think about these images, um, especially the one in the middle, is uh, certainly a future that was constructed, I feel it in my back, this future for me of hunching over a computer is partly my own fault, but it's also constructed by the design of our technologies. And it's tiny micro decisions that are made along the way that lead to these kinds of outcomes. I am sure that no, no one predicted that we would have sore necks from looking down at smartphones all the time in the year 2020, when they started to think about mobile technologies and mobilizing devices. The fourth impact arena is, is a useful one for thinking about 
how we can shift our gaze toward the future rather than just thinking about um, describing or explaining what was or what is. In this case, we can, we can take our research as being directly meant to have impact. And then we can focus on building better, sustainable, possible futures. Um, so it's a really a future orientation that comes out of this impact model of ethics. It takes for granted some of these emerging premises for um, research that uh, pretty soon, if not already, autonomous and automated agents are collecting and aggregating and analyzing data on our behalf. It takes for granted that datafication will become totalized, that data is pervasive, and that is a, a nod to Michael Zimmer's work um, talking about how rich personal information is generated through everyday digital interactions and available for computational analysis. And so once those become embedded in everyday movements and activities of people, then data, which is available for research, becomes pervasive and all-encompassing. And we can start to make a lot more assessments about humans and their ways of being once we have access to more and more. And there's a great power in that. It also, the ethics uh, model of impact, has an orientation that, that admits and acknowledges that ethics will and should be uh, a normative and um, activist sort of orientation. And I think that once we start to think about the possibilities for making social change and, and tackling issues that matter, then we can start to think about uh, the ethical stance that we want to take not just the ethical regulations that we must adhere to. So then we can make proactive choices about what kind of um, research we want to do and in what kind of methods will be best suited to making the kind of change that we seek. It's a different kind of orientation than, than being bound to one's disciplines and doing what one does because we always have done it that way. So this is a, a way of thinking about how we can change our practice to make better possible futures. And uh, in thinking about the future, it's, it's useful to remember that ethics are always situated and highly contested. So while I would like to end this talk by talking about how, <laughs> how we can change our behaviors and be ethical by taking a proactive and personal stance toward making um, good impact versus creepy impact on the future. Um, we are bound by many different uh, constraints and this visual, I like this image because it shows how much ethics is actually uh, contested across domains. So there's likely to be very little overlap between the kinds of constraints that are imposed by one's discipline, the kind of regulations that might come out of local norms and practices, which are often not called regulations, but regulate our activities in any case, the kinds of national regulations and regional regulations we are beholden to, which often take the form of legal parameters, um, then there, I mean, and then other things. Um, so that while we might want to do context-specific ethics or take a proactive approach and engage in, in an ethical research design that it adheres to best practice guidelines, those will often be in conflict with, uh, with regulatory norms. And often the, the regulations will be in conflict with what might be required by third-party platforms themselves in the terms and conditions. So there are lots of different stakeholders in the ethics conversation and 
what this means is that ethics is not actually um, something that can be uh, solved by making statements about what one should do. It's a matter of perhaps asking good questions. And I point to the question-driven approach of the Association of Internet Researchers. Um, I'll zoom in here. You can see that um, no matter what the type of data collected or the type of venue and or context within which that data is collected, there are no guidelines or standard practices. There are only questions about ethical practice. And these then are questions that you as researchers ask of yourselves. So to get the best ethical practice and the best ethical design is not to follow extant guidelines or regulations, although they have to be adhered to, but to go above and beyond those regulations in order to, to make sure that within the specific context or within the specific point of your study where you are at, there's a good ethic at play. So um, it's about finding and asking continuously uh, questions about the context and what one should or can do and how to think about what the possible impact of one's actions might be. I hate to leave it at that to say that it's just a matter of asking questions, but indeed I conflate method and ethic specifically because I think that um, Good ethics are not something that you have in advance. Good ethics come when you, when you engage in a really reflexive and question-oriented practice around your methods and your choice of methods and your choice of practice. And when we reflect on the method carefully and we think about the research as involving multiple methods all the time and, and different ethics to go with different methods, then we get to a stronger output overall. We get to stronger findings, but we also get to better ethics. I'll end by saying that if you wanted to read more about the um, Association of Internet Research Ethics Guidelines, um, go to air.org slash ethics. And we have three different versions of the guidelines published since 2002. If you wanted to learn more about what I write about or talk about, you could go to AnnetteMarkham.com where I make most of my work available. If you wanted to read more, here's a list of books. The one that I mentioned by Mark Johns et al. There's the work by Elizabeth Buchanan, Charles S., Michael Zimmer, Katarina Kinder Kurlanda, and uh, my colleagues Andrew Herman and Kat Tiedenberg. There's also a long-standing and huge conversation around these issues across many disciplines. So here's a handful of research resources that you could um, take a closer look at. And if you need more than this um, or the references that these authors provide, I suggest you send me an email because I can set you up with more than you could ever want to learn about the topic of ethics and online social research. So you can email me at annette.markham at rmit.edu.au and you can find me on Twitter. And I thank you for your time and I hope that we have some questions available here and if I can't answer the questions here because you were not live listening to this talk, then I'm happy to answer these questions in email.